Hello, this is Miss Nelson. Today we are going to be learning about the life cycle of stars. Our learning goals are, I can model or diagram the life cycle of stars, and I can explain how stars produce elements throughout their life cycle. Stars are giant balls of luminous gas. Stars produce energy throughout their life cycle by nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the fusing together of two lower atomic number atoms to produce one higher atomic number atom. If we were to fuse together two hydrogen nuclei, we would produce one helium nuclei and a gamma ray. All stars have some things in common. They all have the same structures. They all produce energy through nuclear fusion, and they are all born inside solar nebulas. All stars are unique. Stars have different compositions. Percentage-wise, they are made of different elements. Now, they all have the same elements, or hydrogen and helium, but they can have a different percent of those elements. They are different sizes, and they are located in different parts of the universe. Like humans, stars have different life stages. Unlike humans, stars' life cycle takes millennia, or even billions of years. It just depends. Based upon the star's size, it may have one of two different life cycles. Both cycles start and end with solar nebulas. All stars are born inside solar nebulas. Because of this, some people call solar nebulas stellar nurseries. Solar nebulas are clouds of dust and gas held together by gravity. For a star to be born, something has to happen, and the dust and gas need to be pushed together. Eventually, gravity takes over the push, and it starts to condense. That something happening is usually a nearby star going supernova. When that star goes supernova, energy and matter push outward. That energy and matter can push the dust and gas in the solar nebula together, starting the condensation of matter. Eventually, enough matter will condense that the heat and pressure will increase to the point where nuclear fusion can start. At that point, a star is born. The star will continue moving through its life cycle. Before the star is born, there is a transition life stage. Before nuclear fusion starts, but while the solar nebula is condensing, so it's not really a solar nebula, we have a protostar. Proto means pre or before. That means the protostar is a before star or a pre-star. Once nuclear fusion starts, a star has been born, but it has to get to that point. In many ways, a protostar is like a fetus. It will someday be a star, but it has to grow and develop before it can actually be a star. Protostars rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. The rotation is caused by the push from the nearby supernova, or whatever causes it to start con to condense. When our sun was a protostar, it was rotating counterclockwise. This is why the planets rotate around the sun in a counterclockwise direction. It's very likely that there are other solar systems out there where the planets rotate around the sun or their star clockwise because that's the direction that the protostar, the matter, which became the star, was rotating it as it formed into a star. Once nuclear fusion has started, a star is born. Depending upon the mass of the star, it can become an average star or a giant star. First, we will be learning about the life cycle of average stars. Then we will learn about the life cycle of giant stars. Average stars life cycle. Matter starts condensing in a solar nebula. As it heats and rotates, a disk will form and eventually a protostar will form. Once nuclear fusion starts, we have an average star. It is literally called an average star. When nuclear fusion starts, these stars are fairly cool, dim, and small. To start, the star will be made mostly of hydrogen gas. As it undergoes nuclear fusion, the hydrogen will fuse and become helium. As the amount of helium in the star increases, the star will become hotter, brighter, and bigger. With our star 3.5 to 4.5 billion years from now, the temperature will have increased to the point where we will no longer have life on Earth. Earth will have an average temperature of 600 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun will have increased in size by 40%. Some rocks on Earth will melt, and the oceans will boil away. Earth will be a dead planet. And that's only 3.5 to 4.5 billion years from now. 5 billion years from now, 50% of the hydrogen will have been used up in nuclear fusion. The core of the sun will have a lot less mass, so it will have shrunk. And the outer layers will have become less dense. At this point, the pressure pushing outward will not equal the pressure pushing inward. The outer layers of the sun will push outward and become a red giant it will enter the next stage of its life cycle, red giant. The size of the star will increase a lot. Our sun will expand and burn up Mercury and Venus. Scientists have predicted different things. So 
I'm not exactly sure if Earth will be consumed by the Red Giant, but if it's not consumed, any possibility of inhabiting Earth will be completely out of the way. But again, remember, 3.5 to 4.5 billion years from now, Earth will have an average temperature of 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So do we really think that we're going to be able to support life on Earth at that point? Red giants are much, much larger than average stars. A large percent of the star is helium. It will become cooler and brighter than the sun is now. When the sun reaches its maximum size, it will start fusing together the helium in its core. Heavier elements will start being produced. As the atoms are fusing together, the star will start contracting. The red giant will continue releasing energy and continue heating up. Eventually, the red giant will start producing carbon. Elements heavier than carbon require a star with a mass at least four times larger than the sun. Once the star has used up its fuel, generally when it has a carbon core, it will transition to the next stage of its life cycle, planetary nebula. When a star has a carbon core, the outer layers are made of lighter elements such as hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Those elements will start to blow away. The blown away layers will become a planetary nebula. Planetary nebulas have been known for a very long time. They are called planetary nebulas because they look like large glowing planets. The name planetary nebula is a misnomer. The name makes it sound like planets are born inside planetary nebulas, but that's not true. Planets are born from the leftovers of solar nebulas during and after a star's birth. Planetary nebulas were named in 1780 by William Herschel. Planetary nebulas can have very different and complex shapes. Some are spherical and some have much stranger shapes. The outer layers of the planetary nebula are electrically charged. This means that they emit light. When the outer layers of a red giant blow away and become planetary nebulas, they can also push matter in a nearby solar nebula together. They can start the nebula condensing and eventually a star can be born from this. White dwarf. While the outer layers of the red giant blow away at the end of that life stage, the core is still left behind. That core becomes a white dwarf star. The formation of the planetary nebula and the white dwarf star are simultaneous. White dwarf stars are very small and very dense. They contain only the heaviest elements the star created. When our star turns into a white dwarf, most of the carbon it fused will be part of the white dwarf star. At this point, the star is no longer able to undergo nuclear fusion. It doesn't have enough energy to keep fusing. Moving forward, the white dwarf star will slowly cool and dim over billions of years. Scientists believe that when white dwarf stars stop producing heat and light, they will turn into black dwarf stars. We believe that it will take trillions of years for white dwarf stars to turn into black dwarf stars. Because our universe is only about 15 billion years old, no white dwarf stars have formed. Scientists aren't sure what black dwarf stars will look like. The particles given off by the star over its life cycle, particularly the particles which make up the planetary nebula, can eventually join another solar nebula. From there, they can become part of a new star and repeat the life cycle. Giant stars. In this part, we will discuss the life cycle of giant stars. Giant stars start the same way as average stars. They are born inside solar nebulas. Something, usually a push from a nearby supernova, causes the matter inside the nebula to start condensing. Matter will start rotating and condensing and heating. Eventually, it will get hot enough for nuclear fusion to start. At that point, a star will be born. While our future star is condensing and heating and rotating, it is a pre-star. Giant stars. Giant stars are giant. Because giant stars are so massive, they fuse their hydrogen at a much faster rate. When the giant star has fused 50% of its hydrogen, it will transition to its next life stage. Giant stars only take a few million years to use up 50% of their hydrogen. Think about that for a minute. A few million years. Earth is 4.8 billion years old. Life arose on Earth 3.8 billion years ago. We're not talking humans, we're talking about bacteria and amoebas. Homo sapiens, humans, evolved about 0.2 million years ago. If our sun was a giant star, Earth might have formed, maybe, we're not sure. But the sun would have transitioned into its next life stage in a few million years. But humans needed a few billion years to evolve into being. If our sun was a giant star's, humans would never have come about. In fact, life on Earth would probably not have happened at all. When 50% of the hydrogen has been fused, the core of the giant star will start to contract. 
At the same time, the outer layers will become less dense and they will start to expand. The giant star will enter its next stage of its life cycle, red supergiant. Red supergiants are much bigger than giant stars. The pressure of the core will increase. This increase in pressure will allow the outer layers to start heating up. At that point, some of the outer layers of the star will start fusing hydrogen. Remember, only 50% of the star's hydrogen has been used up. Overall, the temperature of the red supergiant is cooler. This means that the star emits more of a red coloring, thus their name, red supergiant. Red for cooler may seem counterintuitive. Normally, we use red for hot and blue for cool or colder. But think about a flame for a moment. The hottest part of the flame isn't the tip top point. It's the blue part of the flame. So this blue cone happens to be the hottest port part of our flame. In candles, this blue cone is really hard to see. But if you have a gas stove, you can see this blue cone very easily. The coolest part of the flame happens to be close to the yellow tip. I want to insert a side statement. If you are trying to light something on fire, not necessarily get it to its hottest point, the tip of the candle is better. When you hold a stick over the tip of the candle, it is being bathed with a steady stream of hot air. This causes the stick to heat up a lot faster. Once your stick gets to its ignition temperature, it will start burning. If you hold the wood at the base of the flame, you'll have it at the hottest part, but it won't have that steady stream of hot air bathing it, so it will take a little longer to light on fire. The red supergiant will continue undergoing nuclear fusion until it has an iron core. Iron takes an incredible input of energy to produce. The red supergiant has to expend the energy it produces from fusing hydrogen to create the iron atoms. When the red supergiant has an iron core, it won't have enough energy left to continue fusion. Supernova. Nuclear fusion will stop. Remember, the core of the red supergiant is iron. The core of the star will collapse in less than a second, and the outer layers of the star will explode. This is explosion is called a supernova. For a little while after the supernova, it will be the brightest thing in the night sky. In 185 CE, Common Era, Chinese astronomers noted the appearance of a new bright star in the night sky. It was very bright and it didn't move around like comets did. This bright star took about eight months to fade from view. This explosion, this star, is the first recorded observation of a supernova. Throughout history, we observed a number of stars go supernova. The Crab Nebula is the remains from one particular star going supernova. The heat and pressure from a supernova is one of the few events which can produce the heavier elements in the universe. Elements heavier than iron can be produced by supernovas. That means that all the gold in the universe has been produced by stars going supernova. The shock wave produced by the supernova can cause matter in a nearby solar nebula to start condensing, which can start the birth of a star. Sometimes, but not always, giant stars' life cycle ends with a supernova. Eventually, the matter left over from the star will join a new nebula, and eventually a new star can be born. However, there are two other possible endings. These endings depend largely on the mass of the giant star, neutron star. Sometimes, when the core of a red supergiant isn't exploded, it will become a neutron star. Neutron stars are the smallest, densest stars in the universe. Why the name neutron star? The supernova would have exploded away most of the protons and electrons, leaving behind the neutrons. That means that neutron stars are made mostly of neutrons. And when I say mostly, I mean like 99.999%. Remember, neutrons are neutrally charged. They have no electric charge, whereas protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. Sometimes the neutron star rotates and emits beams of electromagnetic radiation in patterns. Basically, they pulse electromagnetic radiation. This pulsing pattern gives these stars a special name, pulsars. Black hole. The third possible ending for a supernova is a black hole. Supernovas form from the largest and most massive red, red supergiants. You may remember that black holes are singularities. Singularities are things which defy our current understanding of physics. When the core of a red supergiant collapses and the outer layers of the star go supernova, something can happen to the core. If it is massive enough, it will condense to a point where it starts a gravitational cascade, for lack of a better term. Remember, the more massive something is, the more it pulls other objects towards it with gravity. Earth is incredibly massive, so it pulls us towards it. That's why we stand on Earth. We don't float off into space. If that gravity cascade continues, if 
it gets enough of a gravitational pull, it can become a black hole. Remember, black holes have such gravitational pull, they pull in everything around them, including light. Let's cycle around. The neutron star and black hole can eventually cycle back into matter, which can become part of a solar nebula. If matter is part of a solar nebula, it can eventually become a star, and that matter can repeat the life cycle again. The life cycle of all stars depends on their size. The more massive they are, the faster they travel through their life cycle, and the more violent and spectacular their death. Average stars are much less massive, and they work through their life cycle much slower. Let's review. Stars are giant balls of luminous gas. All stars are born in solar nebulas. Solar nebulas are clouds of dust and gas held together by gravity. Something happens, and the dust and gas in the solar nebula start spinning and condensing. For a really long time, the matter will continue rotating, condensing, and heating up. It will become a protostar. Stars have two life cycle journeys. They don't get to choose which path they take. Their path is chosen by their mass. Average stars life cycle in a snapshot. Average stars are smaller. Once nuclear fusion starts in the core of a protostar, it becomes an average star. In billions of years, when 50% of the hydrogen has been fused, the star will expand and become a red giant. When the red giant has a carbon core, the outer layers of the star will blow away and become a planetary nebula. The core will become a white dwarf star. Eventually, the matter from the original star can join a solar nebula and be recycled into a new star. Giant star life cycle in a snapshot. Giant stars are wicked big. Once nuclear fusion starts in the core of the protostar, it can become a giant star. In a few million years, 50% of the hydrogen will have fused. The outer layers of the star will expand and the core will contract. A red supergiant will be formed. Once the red supergiant has an iron core, nuclear fusion will stop. In a fraction of a second, the core will collapse inward, and the rest of the star will explode outward as a supernova. Elements heavier than iron can be produced from this explosion. From here, there are three possible paths for the star. If the giant star wasn't massive enough, it will have ended its life cycle. Matter left over from the star and supernova may eventually join a solar nebula, and the life cycle could start again. When the star goes supernova, if it explodes away the protons and electrons of the core, it will become a neutron star. Sometimes, neutron stars emit energy and pulses, earning the name pulsar. Finally, if the giant star was massive enough, the core can become a black hole. Black holes are singularities. They're zones of space which defy our current understanding of physics. Black holes have such gravitational pull, they pull in everything around them, including light. No matter what, Matter left over from the giant star's life cycle can join a solar nebula and eventually become part of a new star. The amount of time stars exist in each life stage varies. The larger the star is to start, the faster it moves through its life. The less hydrogen a star has, the slower it moves through its life. No matter what, all stars start and end their life cycle the same way. And the elements heavier than iron are produced by supernovas. That gold ring you adore, those atoms of gold were produced by the fiery explosion of a star. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you have a great day. Bye.